women's leadership on the screen, in the streets, and on the world stage. This week, we speak with New Zealand's former Prime Minister Helen Clark and filmmaker Gaylene Preston about Clark's foiled bid to become the UN's first female Secretary General. Then, we stop by the Athena Film Festival to find out why representation remains so important to leadership behind and in front of the camera. And finally, a graphic look at the meaning of the international women's strike. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Madam Clark, you are virtually a household name within the UN system. You could even be described as the establishment candidate. I have never been an establishment candidate for anything. One of the most successful New Zealanders ever produced. Third highest ranking official at the UN. We need to try to build a peaceful and inclusive society. Every night we talk, wouldn't have matter where she is in the world. So by the time I leave to go back to New York, I will have the equivalent of about 90 meals for Dad. I've been into change all my life. Ms. Clark actually tweeted out my research. I did. Did anyone ever say to me, Helen, please uh, come forward? No one will put a red carpet out for any of us. You gotta knock those doors down. She was talking to mm -hmm. us, not mm -hmm. above us. That was a very good speech. What can we do to make you Secretary General? <laughs> there have been eight men over these last 70 years, and there's never been a woman. The UN has got a serious gender problem. It's not geared at selecting the best person for jobs, but all sorts of other things. This is going to be more interesting than the Olympics. It is more interesting than the Olympics. <laughs> An open competition for the most difficult job of the world. Do you consider yourself a feminist? Yes. The answer is yes. I have never said vote for me because I'm a woman. Vote for me because you think I'm the best candidate. It's up to every woman of influence to encourage women to believe in themselves. I was principally interested in the development work that Helen was doing at the UN. Development never gets much interest because it stops terrible things happening. <laughs> and so I just wanted to know what Helen was doing. So I rang Helen and said, can I come and um, see what you're doing? And she said, yes. <laughs> and then that became the run for SG. As a woman becoming the first uh, elected prime minister, the first uh, woman appointed as administrator of UNDP, I don't think in all honesty anyone could see me as an establishment candidate because I've come from out of the box and I'll always be a bit out of the box in looking at how to, uh, in my work, create a ladder of opportunity for others. It's an incredibly important role model. You see, women aren't seeing other women in these positions. They look at the UN, they look at, uh, and I use this example particularly, they look at, say, global health meetings. You can see meetings where there are no women at the table. Now, this is shocking in the 21st century, particularly when you come from a country like New Zealand, where women have done everything and continue to do everything. We have a 37-year-old woman prime minister right now, the third in the world, more women prime ministers than anyone's ever had. So we find this extremely curious. We look at the United States of America, where a highly qualified woman couldn't get elected as president. I think that this uh, is really... Uh, something that should be mobilising women around the world to say enough. We've had enough of these decision-making tables not representing us. We want to be at those tables. We've got a right to be at those tables and we're going to kick the doors in until we get to those tables. Is there any visibility for the UN today? No. When I moved back out of the bubble, uh, and I was in the bubble for eight years, having had a very successful political career at home, 
I don't hear about the UN anymore. I look at the, the shocking conflicts going on. I say, where is the voice uh, of, of the UN? Where is it central to the diplomacy? You know, today, as we record an interview, uh, we will see the Security Council go back to discuss a ceasefire in Syria, which it's been unable to make any decision on for days. I understand that the, the way through it could be that they don't put a time on when the ceasefire could come into effect. I mean, this is the ridiculous sort of thing that goes on when women, men and children are dying as they're bombed uh, outside Damascus. The UN has mandates about equality and gender equity and I was appalled and actually the thing that was, the thing that was really interesting is I knew as a filmmaker and as a person that I didn't know. I knew I didn't know anything. But I think as you see in the film, neither did anyone else. And you've got really experienced journalists there. Everybody doesn't know. And I mean, I think this lack of transparency is really helping prop up the Old Boys Network big time. It's not as though the men have brought great value to Secretaries General. I mean, we've had Kurt Waldheim, who was an, an open supporter of the Nazis. When I was there, I worked under Perez de Cuellar, a lovely man, but highly uninfluential. He was succeeded by Butrus Butrus Ghali, who was a, a, a raving egomaniac. And for the last several years, we've had Ban Ki-moon, who, and I don't mean this to be disrespectful, but has given mediocrity new meaning. So why should we demand of women something that has never been provided by men and and there are excellent women candidates people like Helen Clark who've run the UNDP Irene Bukova who's run UNESCO it isn't as though the men have some superseding capacities that, that uh, exceed those of the women bear in mind that this decision on the Secretary General is is not a quote democratic decision it's not like the World Health Organization or UNESCO where the general membership votes on who the leader will be. At the UN you have this power structure that was established in 1945 with the victor countries of 1945 taking the permanent seats on the Security Council and over the last 70 plus years they've accrued a lot of power to themselves to the extent that basically they choose the Secretary General. And of course, great powers don't particularly want anyone who will stand up to them. So, you know, the chances of independent-minded people from independent-minded small countries who, who might actually do some things uh, coming through hasn't been so great. Some people get very depressed by it. And we say, don't get depressed, <laughs> get mad, get angry, get organised. What this really needs is a democratisation of process uh, where the general membership uh, would actually vote exhaustively to get the decision. You know, so, so let that emotion uh, come, come out. It's all about being enraged. I think we've, we've got a culture at the moment that sees anger as a bad thing. It, it can be, but I think being enraged can be, it, it can give you energy to change things. And uh, so all my films are about that. And I think this one is particularly particularly useful in that regard, yeah. It's had a, a very, very good reception and I think you know, probably the, the best thing about the screenings for us is the conversations that happen afterwards. Yeah. I've been making films for 40 years. I have always worked mainly with men because that's who's been there to do it. I was, I was uh, passing a film crew working here in New York just as I was wandering home to the subway a couple of nights ago. All men, I don't think there was a single woman there. There's, we have a better track record than that, but it's still not good. But the thing is, it's not just about, it's not just about how many women you have on your crew or, or how many women get to actually make films. It's the stories that don't get told. It's the complete patriarchy that is seen every night on the news. I mean, if you take out the presenters, all you have to do is count the talking heads the experts. There's, there's a lot of things that are in, they're embedded in, in us and they're embedded in our children and it's very hard to get away from. My whole life has been one around breaking glass ceilings myself uh, in the hope that uh, other women will also take their position as full and equal participants in societies, politics, economies, with equal rights and opportunity under the law. The problem is the world has 
shared challenges. And if you've got a shared challenge, everybody's got to be part of finding the solution. But the US has got off that particular train journey at the moment, so it's missing an action on Paris. Now, thank heavens for a decentralized system of government in the United States of America. So we will see the Californias and the Oregons and the New York states and very, very powerful uh, big states uh, in this country do their bit see big mayors and councils do their bit. But unfortunately, the US as such is not part of the climate change solution today. Uh, similarly, on the global trade talks, you need US leadership. It is not there. And we could go on. Uh, there is uh, this uh, part of the discussion at the UN where countries are told, if you don't vote with us, then we cut your money. Well, fortunately, most don't give in to that. You know, they do, people do have principles and some bottom lines in the end, but it's not making for a good working atmosphere. I'm a big advocate of people getting mobilised and getting into structures. So it can be you know, very mm, inspirational to go and join a huge march, but that's one day. Uh, to really affect change, you have to you know, storm the citadels of power where decisions are made. And that means the, the hard grind of elective office, of you know, serious advocacy groups who maintain uh, strong relationships with decision makers. In other words, I think it's time to get organised because some of these challenges are slipping to the point where they're almost insoluble. And with the uh, Paris Climate Change Agreement, which has an aspiration that global warming would not exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial level, we're now told uh, that uh, we'll reach that level in the 2040s. Now, that's not far away. And we're on a course for a three to four degree future, not 1.5. Now, that is catastrophic for everybody, not only small island developing states, not only the Philippines, not only the Sahel and the Horn of Africa, which are so dry already, or Cape Town, which is about to run out of water. But it's disastrous for all of us who, who need food, live by the coastline, big river mouths. We are really delaying action to the point where it's extremely dangerous. Well, the, the nuclear issue has been parked for years because great powers are not serious about negotiating total uh, disarmament. And meantime, a number of other countries have uh, acquired nuclear weapons. So it's the, the sleeper crisis at the moment. There were times back in the Reagan years where you know, we prepared for the, the worst and argued for something uh, better. And now the issue's gone quiet, but it's just as dangerous, particularly when you look at the war of words over North Korea. What is power in the end if you can use it for something good to advocate for good, for good causes and inspire other people? Uh, that's a positive thing. But certainly when you look back over the years at the way in which the Secretary General position has been framed, it has not been framed as a leadership position. Now, to any of us from outside the bubble, we would look and say, shouldn't the person who heads the United Nations be a leader? But that's not how a lot of countries have seen it. They want a servant. They want a secretary. So when you present as a, you know, clearly a, a woman who has strength and you come from a country which is independent minded and you are very identified with that country's foreign policy, I'm sure that can be deeply threatening to a number of member states, including great ones, because uh, you're not easy to control. They say you were warm. Warm? Warm. You came across as warm. Oh, I hope so. I hope so. There you go. OK. Go home. Your wife never sees you. <laughs> They're not half as demanding as a New Zealand political man. I think that every corporation, wherever there's money and power, you usually find women busy at the beginning of things. So you could say that Helen and I are two people who've been at the beginning of things. So I was at the beginning of the New Zealand film industry, so I could be considered a pioneer. You find women at the beginning of the French Revolution. It was actually a, a revolution, it was actually a protest of housewives over bread. It, to begin with, the storming of the Bastille. But once money and power come in, the women are suppressed. And I think you find that everywhere. They have to get out there and get organised. They have to, uh, whether it's in this country, seeing the parallels with what happened with Hillary Clinton, uh, 
They need to be thinking about these midterms, uh, get involved with candidates that they believe in, they think can make a difference. In the end, if you're going to change power structures, you have to get into them and you have to support other people who uh, have the ability to change those things. Yeah, and I think we need men. I mean, making a film is a, is a good thing. You know, you, you, you take it to a broad audience. So uh, my year with Helen has been in, in New Zealand in cinemas um, with substantial audiences. And I think you can help bring men alongside because you're not going to get anywhere if it's just women fighting alone. We have to be fighting together. It's actually about equality. And, and so having a clear analysis around gender, I think is, you know, that's the personal politics is the root of all politics to me. You can't, you can't go out there and make great speeches and then go home and beat your wife. And, the, you know, it, there's been too much of all that going on and it is time it stops. It is time. Having been so many years in leadership positions, high profile ones, and being a person who has you know, known positions on quite a number of important issues, I get asked to do a lot. I get asked to speak a lot, being at a lot of events, uh, join advisory boards for this or that. So basically I'm enjoying myself, uh, picking up the issues that I'm passionate about. I still speak a lot about sustainable development, gender equality, big health issues and uh, occasionally on peace and justice as well, so I have plenty to keep me going. These past six months have seen what feels like a tidal wave hit Hollywood with an unprecedented number of powerful men falling like a deck of cards after the Harvey Weinstein scandal broke last October. For women in entertainment and women in all sectors, this moment of reckoning has been in the making for far too long. But some women have been shouting about systemic sexism in the entertainment industry and patriarchal wrongdoing for decades. It was in this spirit that the Athena Film Festival was created. Now in its eighth year, the festival puts the spotlight on female leadership. We caught up with some of the filmmakers and moviegoers in attendance this year. Take a look. There's been a groundswell over the last couple of years of people paying attention to the lack of women on screen with agency. We always had our purpose, but I think people are feeling the purpose in a different way. I think a focus on female voices is very important because we're underrepresented in Hollywood, especially uh, people of color. It got me excited to sort of come and support the cause because we need more representation. It's important to see myself up there on the screen and, to, and for women to see themselves up there on the screen and behind the camera and everything. So I saw Lady Bird. I thought it was a really cool film, like showing the perspective of like a female growing up, I guess, in Sacramento. Usually coming of age stories, it's like male-centered. Like I know um, Me, Earl and the Dying Girl, which is like about, it's centered on him, even though like this girl is dying. <laughs> it's like the manic pixie dream girl kind of thing, like Garden State and all that. Basically they just serve the purpose to like advance the guy instead of having their own place in the world. The films that we're seeing now are far more interested in individual stories as opposed to how a woman can fit into a story with a man. Um, a lot of, you know, the princesses in the past, they get their prince and they live happily ever after. And now we're seeing princesses like Moana, you know, films in which women can be their own heroes and they don't need another person to sort of fulfill their lives. A woman is just as capable as a man is of achieving greatness and happiness. Athena is, is an amazing venue with an amazing theme. The fact that we're the showcase uh, film tonight is such an honor. Wilma Mankiller was the first woman elected Principal Chief of the Cherokee Nation. She was an amazing leader and a role model to not just the Cherokee people, but to women and minorities and actually everyone. She just showed us, you don't have to come from money. You don't have to be healthy necessarily. She was sick and you can still be powerful and it comes from within. It's not something that's like a birthright. You don't have to be male. Her message is something that I personally feel our leaders, our elected leaders, need to have as a role model and need to listen to her. The Cherokee Nation has always been a matriarchal nation. Women signed the treaties 
with the men, and it was only through interaction with white Europeans that that changed. Wilma was able to overcome a great deal of gender bias. She worked in a bipartisan manner, reached across the aisle to people who had different beliefs than she did, um, and she always put her people first. One of the hallmarks of the Time's Up moment is that women are not in positions of power in you know, every segment of life. This movement is really bringing to the forefront something that has been present in Hollywood for a very long time. I think that it's finally being addressed and I hope that through this address we don't sort of sweep it under the rug. I'm very, very concerned about the backlash, the change from this is important, this is way overdue to okay, enough already. I'm really hoping that future generations of women can participate in Hollywood and not have to fear that sort of that sort of sexual violence. Men want to believe that it's not a problem. We just can't give up because it's difficult and because we're being attacked. The idea that if you're sexually assaulted, the best thing that you can do is keep it quiet is something that's definitely been, I think, taught to women most of our lives. You grow up thinking that like, if you are sexually assaulted, it is your fault. You did something to ask for it or provoke it or something. Like the Me Too movement like coming up and the Time's Up movement and everything, I think is just like, just a message to like young girls everywhere that like you shouldn't just stand for this stuff. Also not like having to like conform to like the stigma of like this is what I need to do to like make myself someone in Hollywood and this is what I need to do to be someone. There's not a lot of safe spaces for women out there. I really felt like a lot of solidarity in the room. It wasn't like we were all just sitting there watching movies like alone. We're sitting there watching a movie together, like someone sneezed and like someone across the room said bless you. It's like such a pure atmosphere to just like sit around and watch a movie in. The international women's strike is evidence of a new wave of radicalism, solidarity, and internationalism. Women's lives connect because the issues we're up against are connected. And the pressure on the women of the 99% has only gotten worse under neoliberalism. In the workplace, at home, and outside of it, policies that favor men and white people leave a majority of the planet women at risk. That creates a massive pool of people vulnerable to exploitation, poverty, sickness, and violence. When women thrive, communities do too, but the same is true in reverse. Society couldn't get by without women's paid and unpaid labor, but it's not recognized, treated equally, or paid enough. In the workplace, two-thirds of low-wage workers are female. Precarious conditions make them vulnerable to everything from harassment and wage theft to violence. Women need living wages, one fair minimum legally enforced, and the recognition of women's rights under the law wherever they work. What else would help? Universal social services, like education, including for people with disabilities and special needs, health care, for cis and trans women alike. Care for people who need it at all stages of life. Affordable housing and good public transportation. Good shared social services help everyone, but we'll never get them as long as society can force women to take up the slack. White supremacy, just like patriarchy and neoliberalism, is real. Racial hierarchies make women of color's lives seem less valuable than their white counterparts. As a result, employers get away with paying women of color even less. Women of color have lower wages, less wealth, and shorter life expectancy than white women. Undocumented immigrant women are the most vulnerable of all. It's a drive to the very bottom for wages and services and rights. That's why it's important to stop mass deportations and start protecting everyone for all our sakes says the women's strike. The international women's strike platform recognizes two main pillars of the status quo, neoliberal and neocolonial policies and the police state. With mass surveillance, mass incarceration, police brutality, and militarization, the police state divides us. 
but only by working together across borders will we ever end colonization, militarization, climate catastrophe, and build a better society. Women are showing the way forward. Find out more at the International Women's Strike website. Thanks. Thanks for watching The Laura Flanders Show. If you want to receive weekly commentary from me or find out early what we've got coming up, sign up to become a monthly member on our Patreon site and receive exclusive access to member-only content, including extra interviews, podcasts, and more good stuff. Don't forget, you can follow us on social media and feel free to write to me and tell me what you think. That's Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at lauraflanders.org. Well, thanks for watching. Stay kind, stay curious. Till next time, I'm Laura Flanders.